Ready? Okay. Welcome to the Simplicity of the Gospel brought to you by the Pegwell Community Church of Christ Church in Barbados. I want to welcome all of you to church. I'm so glad that you're not getting tired or weary. You have got to make time for God. You've got to make time for church. It's getting more and more difficult to serve the Lord. I don't know if you observe that, but, but it's going to be worth it all in the end. So you're going to have to run. You're going to have to struggle. You're going to have to fight. You're going to have to contend because it is going to be worth it all in the end. The songwriter says, uh, one glimpse of his dear face. All sorrows will erase. So let us run this race until we see Christ. You've got to have that in mind. What, what is the alternative if you're not running? What is the alternative if you give up? So Father, we pray tonight that you will be here. You'll speak to our hearts. We, we, we invite the Spirit of God to have his way. Our bodies are the temple of the Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost is within us. And we give him permission to do whatever he wants tonight. To speak, to rebuke, to encourage, to remind Whatever it is he wants to do tonight. And Lord, the notes that I have on paper, the notes I have on my heart, I pray that you will audit them tonight. I pray that you will edit them tonight, Father. And whatever ought to be omitted, whatever ought to be included, I pray that your people will hear tonight in the name of Jesus. And everybody said, Amen. Not long ago, we were talking about, we were talking about looking for the blessed hope. What is the blessed hope? The glorious appearing of our God and Savior Jesus Christ. I want to start there tonight. And I want to show you some things uh, more so with the emphasis on, uh, on the pastor's responsibility. So I want to talk tonight about a call, this is my topic, a call for authoritative preaching. A call for authoritative preaching. In other words, that, that will get rid of the messing around in the pulpit and fooling around in the pulpit not studying to show yourself approved, it will get rid of all of that because as we look at the word of God, we're going to see how important the pastor's job is tonight. And I hope that at the end of this, you'll spend all next week, at least sometime every day, to pray for your pastor. Amen? Because of the responsibility. So let, let me start again in Titus chapter 2. Titus chapter 2. And I'm going to begin at verse 1. I'm going to just read an extended portion of the scripture. Anybody drive in? will not be able to open the Bible, so they'll be able to hear what I'm saying. And not only that, you will become more and more acquainted with the Word of God. So in Titus chapter 2, I'm going to go back to Titus chapter 1 later on, but I'm beginning with chapter 2. And we're going to show that looking for the coming of the Lord is so important that he starts to address everybody. How we ought to live life, a life here on this, on this planet. So in verse 2 he says, But speak thou the things which, which become sound doctrine. Titus is a pastor. The only other pastor in, the, in, the, in this text, in the New Testament, is Timothy. So we call the book of Titus and the two books of Timothy, we call those pastoral epistles. In those epistles, Paul wrote to pastors and pastors were supposed to communicate what, he, what they got to the congregation. They had very big congregations. They were only about 25 years old, both of them. And they had congregations of between 20 and 30,000 persons attending church. So he's, Paul said to, to, to uh, Titus, Titus, there's no time to fool around in the pulpit. Speak the things that become sung doctrine. And this is what is sung doctrine. Verse 2, that the aged men be sober, grave. The word grave means serious, but it also means dignified. So the old men in church ought to be dignified, temperate, not blowing a, 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 a valve every minute, blowing off the handle. They should be sound in faith. They should be people of faith. They should be sound in charity. They should be sound in patience. He said, tell the poor, this is sound doctrine. Tell the aged women that they should be in behavior as become holiness. They should walk holy. They should live holy. They should give a, a holy advice. They should dress holy. Teach the older women to be and behave as become holiness. Not false accusers. Not given to much wine. But they should be teachers of good things. And these older ladies, verse 4, may teach the young women to be sober. If you watch crop over, you'll notice that young women are not sober again. Huh? But they ought, they've got to be taught. We throw up our hands in despair. We say, que sera, sera. And as soon as the children leave school, we don't see them in church anymore because the parents have given upon them. Well, you know, we have freedom. That's what they say. 
You know, freedom is freedom to do what is right. Oh, don't you have freedom? You can't go into a crowded uh, cinema and shout fire. As much freedom as you have. You're going to jail for 10 years, especially if people die. So we've got to understand that your freedom could impinge upon somebody else. I always say a lot of ignorant talk about, this is my mouth. I could talk what I like. I got freedom. No, you can't talk what you like. No, 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 no. When your freedom impinges upon mine, that's where you go shut your mouth up. Anybody understand what I'm saying? That's what freedom is. Freedom to do the right thing. Paul said, don't use your freedom as a cloak for maliciousness. From maliciousness, we get malice. So although you have freedom, you can't drive at 100 miles per hour. As much freedom as you have. There's certain things that you can't do. So they may teach the young women to be sober, number one. That the older women may teach the younger women to love their husbands. So I said last time that loving your husband seems to be something that ought to be taught. It is not natural. And the age women ought to teach the older women, the age women ought to teach the younger women that. So they first should love their own husbands that they know what to tell the young ones. Can they get an amen if you're not scared? Yeah. Amen. But also, they should teach the younger children to love, the younger ones to love their children. So to love your children seems to be, according to the scripture, as something that ought to be taught. And that's not the pastor's job. That's the older women in church that will come to church and get into the service, read the Bible, open the Bible, give an amen, a hallelujah, a testimony, so that when they're ready to advise these young people, the young people don't want to say, you better get out of my face. So you understand the sort of life that they ought to live. But they ought to teach the young people in verse 5, the younger women, to be discreet, to be chaste, morally pure. So they themselves got to be morally pure. To be keepers at home. That means a whole lot more than just washing the pots and pans. But keeping the family together to some extent is usually the, the, the job of the mother. Because maybe it's because she's the one that ought to be at home, whereas the husband ought to be out bringing the bread in. Amen? Keepers at home. She ought to teach the younger people to be good. So to be good seems to be something that ought to be taught. It doesn't seem as though it's automatic. Teach them to be good, to be obedient to their own husbands and not somebody else's husband. And that seems to be the trend today. Women are obedient to everybody else's husband, but not to their own husband. Now you're thinking about, you're, you're, you're thinking funny, your mind going all the way down. But if you're a boss, if you're, a, if you're obedient to your boss, and you can't obey your own husband, you're obedient to another, another woman's husband. Am I making sense? Yeah, so you think you're talking about a psychic? I mean that too. I mean that too, but, but, but I, I want to get you not to go down there so far. So quickly, amen? Amen. So you teach the young women to be obedient to their own husbands. These are the days where women live. No women in obedience to their husbands at all. If you find one of them, please introduce me to them. I'll use them as an example from the pulpit. But women are not obedient to their husband anymore. Every woman is getting, you know, getting up. Let me get my education. Let me bring in my own dollar. Let me do this and God do for you, do work for you. As a matter of fact, the Bible does teach us that the time is going to come when a woman is going to say, all I want from you is a child. You know that's in the Bible? Because she can't get it for herself. So that's all she wants a man for. So men, if you live long enough, understand that that's coming. She's going to be CEO. She's going to own her own business. She's going to have her PhD. She's going to be driving a big Mustang or something like that. She's not interested in you right now. They're interested in your far less when she gets up top there. So if she wants a child, she can't get it herself. Unless you go to artificial insemination. There's a place down here since I know where it is. I could uh, direct you there. Is next there by Rex there by the gap that you're going to Palm Marine. You understand right there at the corner? Artificial insemination. Uh, when you get inseminated by somebody else's sperm and you have a baby and you don't know who the father is. Of course, they would know who the father is because they have to label them and all that. But you understand what I'm saying? Okay. That they should be obedient to their own husbands. That, that the word of God be not blasphemed. So all of these instructions are not given to take the happiness out of your life. It is for you to adorn the gospel. And when you adorn something, like you adorn your Christmas tree, you make it look beautiful. Isn't that? When you women adorn yourself, you make yourself look beautiful. So we're going to come to that word later on. We do these things to adorn the gospel so that it will be attractive to others. But if you call your child of God and you're not fulfilling any of those verses that I just read, you're not adorning the gospel. So young men, he's talking to young men also in verse 6. Likewise, exhort young men to be sober-minded. Something wrong with them again today. So now we understand that although this book is written 2,000 years ago, now we understand why the Lord said that we should exhort young men to be sober-minded. 
But then he goes back in verse 7 to, to, to Titus himself. Titus, while you're doing all of that, you yourself, you show yourself a pattern of good works. You're the, as the pastor. In the doctrine that you're preaching, Titus, show yourself uncorrupt, showing uncorruptness, showing spiritual depth, showing sincerity. Also, Titus, in verse 8, when you preach, have sound doctrine that cannot be condemned. And that is required more so now than ever. Because, you know, you all have your television that you could go on and YouTube and everything that you could go and fact check your preacher. I'm going to be talking about that later on, but in the next 15 minutes. So the pastor has to come now with sound doctrine because you could go and you could check and see if he's wrong or right. But that's only if you know the scripture. That's only if you know the scripture. I mean, when, the, when you go to the doctor and the doctor tells you that you have this, that, or the other, you don't know if he's telling the truth or not, you're going to believe him. Because you don't know. So when you hear some of these preachers, because you don't know your Bible, you, I see some people send a lot of amen. Some from our church too. Amen to trash. To amen to things that are not biblical at all. If you don't know the Bible, there's some, there's some, there's some programs that you ought not to be watching. You got to keep away from 3ABN which is the Seventh-day Adventist channel, all right? They have a lot of good things inside there. But, you know, they're having some that's not good at all. So the best thing to do is to keep away. Let me give you an example that's going to be very crude. So you are baking a cake for some children that they're playing, and you bake a cake, and when they finish, you call them, and you tell them, come, um, come in, it's time to eat. And you slice up the cake and everything, and they're ready to eat. And they say, but I want to tell you one thing first. You know, this is a big, big cake. But when I was baking it, I just put in two drops of dog poo. How many of you can eat that cake? Talk, talk to me. How many of you can eat that? So you see, when you watch certain channels, a lot of things are good. But you see that little bit of dog poo? That's the one that you got to watch. I said dog poo. I could have said, said strychnine. I could have said something else. But I wanted to be crude so that you remember. Uh, so you're not going to take that. So you gotta be careful. You gotta be careful these channels that you're going. Not that the seven day events will put you in hell. No, 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 I'm not saying that. I'm just saying that some of their doctrines we don't agree with. But they they are good people. They don't tell you go commit adultery, they don't tell you go murder anybody. They, they preach the gospel just like we do. But there's certain things that if you don't know the Bible, if you don't know the Bible, they can put you off. All right? So let's get back here. Uh, verse 8. Titus preached song speech that cannot be condemned. That, that he that is of the contrary part, and they have a lot of those out there criticizing the church, that there might be a shame having no evil thing to speak of you, Timothy. And then he goes back now to servants. For the word servants, you could put slaves in. Some people say that part of the Bible does not address the subject of slaves. That is not true. This word servants here is also the word that translates slaves. If you go and check your original language, you see it is doulos. That's the word for slaves. So he's addressing slaves. We, we give them a fancy name these days. We call them maids and all sorts of things. But basically, slave is the word that was used in the Bible times. So we're talking about this. Uh, exhort, encourage servants to be obedient to their own masters. Let's go back to Bussa. Bussa, if you live at Spencer's, yeah, obedient to the other slave master that's done a hand in St. Lucy, you gotta be, uh, you got to be obedient to your own master. Anybody with me? Uh, servants be obedient to your own masters and to please them well in all things another word we could put for servants here is employees you go to work in the people place they didn't call you you went and asked them for a job for the first two weeks everything is fine third week now you want to tell them how to run your business you know I could come in my hair anyhow I don't have to wear any tie I could wear my we just call them Crocs. I could wear my Crocs to work. You know, a man gave your job. He has a special way that he wants his job to look. But no, he can't do that because you'll be taking away the man's freedom. But the Bible said that you should please them well in all things. Not answering again. No back talking. Pastor, you reading old fashioned things that are not for the day. Pastor, you better wake up and smell the coffee. Wait, I'm going down. You, you, I'm going down. Hold on, hold on. Verse 10, not pilfering is the modern word. The old English word is purloining, which means stealing. Don't steal things from your boss. Stop pilfering. 
But showing good fidelity, the word fidelity means faithfulness. Be faithful on the job. Don't go in the bathroom and sit down for half an hour while you're texting people. And you check your text messages. Also, if you work up front, if you work up front as a cashier, do not open your Bible on the people's desk. They didn't employ you there to be a Christian. They employ you there to work. You have your Bible there on the people's desk. And my, my best customer is, is a Muslim. My biggest customer is a Muslim. And you have your Bible open on the desk. You want, I didn't employ you to do that. You want to read the Bible when you get home. Anybody understand what I'm saying? You understand what I'm saying? I go into places and I see the, the, the holy ones, you know, the holy ones. The holy ones. And their Bible or the little Bible open. No. Don't do that. That's not what I employ you for. Go work at the church. You can open your Bible all day long. Anybody understanding me? Good. Showing good fidelity. Look at verse 10. Why you do all of that that I just read? That you may adorn the doctrine of God our Savior in all things. You must make the gospel attractive. You must make the gospel attractive. I say we. We must make the gospel attractive. We must adorn it. So now verse 11. Why? The word for there means because. You do all of that because the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared unto all men. Two things about that. Is the grace of God is something that he's offered free to you. For by grace are we saved. Is a gift of God. So we ought to be grateful. Oh, do like, remember you buy them a gift? Next morning they're going on to look at the CD price. Oh, they're not Woolworth and everything. Look and see how much this costs. No, no, no. When you get a gift, all you should say is thank you. Men don't go do that, I don't think, unless it's start now. But years ago, women would go downtown. You know, they wonder how much this costs, if you buy them a cheap gift or not. No, no, no. The grace of God has appeared unto all men. Be thankful. You're on your way to hell. But the grace of God appeared. Huh? The grace of God. The grace of God. You can't earn it. You can't tell God you got to give me his grace. Has appeared unto all men so nobody don't have an excuse. Whether you go to church or not, you don't have an excuse. The grace of God has appeared unto all men. And it does something. The grace of God teaches us. Teaches us. That denying ungodliness. We're going we're gonna to explain these words soon. A few minutes. The, word, the grace of God teaches us that because if we don't deny this, we are not going to see that blessed hope that we're talking about at the end of this verse. The blessed hope is the glorious coming of God. That's what the church is looking for now. So you should deny ungodliness. I'm going to tell you what that means in a minute. That you should, um, uh, you should deny worldly lust. The worldly lust is really strong, you know. And that you should live soberly in the right frame of mind, thinking straight. And righteously doing the right things according to God's standard. And godly being like God, that's how we should live in this present world. Listen, we all looking for heaven. But here the Lord said, take your eyes off of heaven right now. Forget heaven right now. Think about this present world. How are you living in this present world? You still telling people things like, you better don't mess with me. You better remember where you come from. You, you, you know where you come from? You know people, Christians still say that? You know who I is? Don't let me go take off my shoes for you. And if I go take off my earrings, I'm worse. You, you understand? No, 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 no. In this present world, you can't live like that. In this present world, you cannot live like that if you're looking for this blessed hope. But let me go on. At verse, verse 13. We shall live, verse 12, looking for the blessed hope. What is the blessed hope? The glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. He's coming again. In power and great glory, he's coming again. Revelation says when he comes, they're going to be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Because there are those who are going to hear, depart from here, I never knew you. But God is saying, it ain't my fault. I gave my grace so that you could be saved. I gave everybody my grace. Is God so loved the world. Not only the people at Peg, well, the world. Not only the saved, he loved the world. So we don't have an excuse. They're going to be weeping and gnashing. It's going to be so bad that all the, the big commercial experts on the land is going to be asking the mountains to fall on them. Asking the big rocks to fall on them. It's going to be so bad. So when they get here hollering, hollering, hollering all the time, you might think that I'm making fun. No, 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 I'm hollering to tell you, you only got one chance. I still have some people in front of me who push up their mouths and things like that. 
Who cares? We're going to deal with that in a minute. That's why I start so early. We have a whole hour to go. Are you ready for some new word tonight? All right. Who gave himself for us? You don't have any excuse. Look what he did. He gave himself. The Bible said that the Father, God, did not withhold his only begotten Son, but he freely delivered him up for us all. What excuse are we going to give? I think that I would have hid my son under the bed. You ask the police who looking for looking for your son and tell you you could bring him into you could bring him into the station with, with, a, with, with, with a lawyer if you want to. Who for a mother gonna do that? She can hide him, although she can get charged for aiding and abetting. But who's gonna do that? But but the father did that. Her father did that. Who gave himself for us? Why? That he might redeem. The weird word redeem means to buy back. Because we were in the slave market of sin. Stripped naked so to speak. And the buyers came in to buy us. You know that how you used to buy slaves? You got to show your teeth to see if you had good teeth. You had to flex your muscles to see how strong you are. Because you got a lot of work to do out there. In the plant, uh, uh, out there you know? So the Lord came and he bought us back. He bought us in the market and brought us out of the market. We ain't got no excuse. We keep talking about God sending people to hell. Lord not sending anybody to hell. The Lord already put his cards on the table. And you can see them here right now. That he might redeem us from all iniquity. Why are you walking around with iniquity? Why are you walking around with sin? When the Lord says if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So he, he redeems us from all iniquity and he's purifying for himself a unique people. If you're unique, you've got to be prepared for a lot. You've got to be prepared for persecution, ridicule, and all that because you're square peg in the wrong hole. You look different. You're not saying the same thing everybody's saying. But God wants us to be a peculiar people, zealous of good work. And Titus, verse 15, he back to Titus again. Titus, these things, I'm going to explain this in a minute. These things, Titus, speak and exhort and rebuke with all authority. Titus, do all you can to make sure you give people the opportunity to accept Jesus Christ as Lord and be there for this coming of the Lord. It's going to be splendiferous. Man, there are some things that happen on this, on this world, like the, the opening, opening, certain opening ceremonies, not the last one that in France, that, that's, that's a dud. But they look so good. The Emmys look real nice. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Man, all these things that I look at the television, I can't believe that a human being can make something look so nice. And all the pyrotechnics and all that, all the lighting and all that looks so good. Listen, that's going to be like nothing at this glorious appearing. It's going to be wonderful. The Bible said, and this, the sad thing is that the Bible said every eye shall see him when he comes. But not every eye going to remain with him. Every eye is going to see him when he comes. But you won't have your telephone that to keep noise at the time when the Lord talking. <laughs> huh? Every eye is going to see him. Could you imagine seeing and can't this? Could you imagine seeing this plain different thing? And then when you stand before God, the Lord says, let me use a Bajan term. You better go from about here. I gave you all the opportunity. And you come to church and behave how you want to behave. Because you think you are Lord unto yourself. You don't come when you don't want to come. When you come, and when you take three and four months to pay, to pay the little toys that you know you got home with you. And you won't put it in the orphan, although you know the church waiting on it. All them sort of things you're doing and expect that you're going to be part of that. Listen, brethren, I want to teach you tonight or sometime about keeping your mouth shut. You know? And enjoying hardship as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. You ain't got to talk about everything. In Psalm 118, the psalm that the Lord showed me nearly 50 years ago. He says, the Lord takes my part with them that help me. So there are people that help me. You would think that we're going to help start lifting helping some the weight too. No, 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 no. The Lord said, I'm going to take your part. And it says, therefore, I will see my revenge upon them that hate me. If you hate me, God is just there waiting for you. Huh? I, will see, I have to do a thing. Shut your mouth. Commit yourself into the hands of the Lord. Shut your mouth. Go to Psalm 180 sometime and learn it. Another part says God is for me. And I noticed that that is written in the New Living Translation. Because I checked it. I don't want to be wrong. God is for you. 
God is forming. But let's, let, let's look back. From verse 11 down, it tells us about this glorious appearance, which all of us should be looking forward to. But I want to go and show you from chapter 1, the sort of people that Titus had to deal with, and show you why the Lord is telling him, let no man despise your use, speak thou the things that become some doctrine, uh, and all these things that he said, he's saying to Titus that he should do. Teach everybody, the old men, the young, teach everybody. It doesn't matter whether they receive it or not, you just teach it. Let's see why he did that. So I'm going back to chapter 1. Chapter 1. Notice these days I'm not preaching, I'm teaching. A preacher proclaims. A teacher explains. The preacher proclaims. He doesn't even have to look at his notes because he preached the message 36 times already. So he knows it in his heart. And you'll come and tell me, Pastor, wow. You see him, wow, he didn't even have to look in the Bible. He didn't even have to look at his notes. He preached it 40 times already. What do you expect unless he's dumb? I can't do that. Because I'm here with you every night. They can't bring the same old soup every thing, every time. And they have some cooks that rake up all the old things out of the fridge and show it in the soup. You can't always do that. You can't do that. Things that ought to be in the soup and things that ought not to be in the soup. You think you're cooking for a dog? Anybody know what I'm talking about? Pick up every old thing that's in the fridge and throw it in the soup. You don't know what I'm talking about? I neither. <laughs> oh, the Lord is so good. Now this, this is all part of what I'm teaching you. I may not get to it tonight. Because you see what I was just saying? That is going to tie into the parable of the sower. The four, four different soils that, 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 the, that the seed fell on. And one of the first one is that the pastor has to make the people understand. Understand. Because the Bible says if they did not understand it, the enemy is going to come and steal it away. So they say in public speaking, you must have some, you must have some lightheartedness. They say you should have some, some visuals. Visuals. You should have some storytelling. You do whatever you can to get the people to remember what you say. So don't make the little stupid things that he says sometimes. That's well planned. And that's to get you to understand what I say. But I don't want you to remember the trash that I say. I don't want you to only remember that. I want you to remember the substance of what I'm saying. All right? So in, 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 in Titus chapter 1, you're going to learn something from this. Paul, a servant of God. Today the man won't be calling a servant, you know. I got to be doctor this. I got to be apostle this. I got to be... I got to be general this. Uh, a fellow the other day from around here was calling himself the chief executive officer of the church. I got to be chief executive. What, what, what sort of nonsense is this? You notice in the Bible that there's nobody apart from Jesus that called himself John Jones. It's always just John. Paul, Timothy, Titus, Ezekiel, Isaiah. But we got to make a big fact. I'm Dr. the Honorable Pastor uh, Apostle Jim Jones. What's all trash that is? And you ain't got nothing to say after it. Nothing to say after it. I'm saying this to you guys who got the opportunity now to go on television and listen to all those Africans. If you don't know the Bible, those Africans can put you wrong. Because you got to get the motive of the preacher. Does he want money? Does he want to be seen of men? All that's in scripture. Does he really understand the scripture? Is he dealing with foolish people in front of him that he could talk whatever nonsense he wants to talk? And then when you pick that up and bring that to Pegwell Community Church, and they say, no, not about here, you're going to leave. No, no, no. There's some order. We're going to talk, we talk about order a little bit on Sunday. We've got to talk about order. The Bible said in 1 Corinthians 10, 40 or something like that, that we should do all things decently and in order. 1 Corinthians 14, 40, I think it is. We should do things decently and in order. Every church has an order, okay? You follow the order when you join the church. If you don't like the order, go join another order. Go to another church that does the things that you want to get done. Are you with me? You have that scripture. If you don't have it, it's okay. But the Bible said do things decently and in order. You don't have the church run like you run an animal farm. No, no. Must be done decently. So look at Titus. Titus. Paul said, uh, Paul, a servant of God. If there was somebody that could get himself a lot of big names, Paul. He said, an apostle of Jesus Christ according to the faith of God elect. Huh? In hope of eternal life, etc. 
section. Verse 4. Paul to Titus, my own son after the common faith. We started some time ago to deal with sonship. And ministers, some five, four ministers' sons don't understand sonship. But if they read Paul right into some of his sons, he said, he, he talked a lot about sonship. And he talked about Titus and Timothy. He said that you, you behave with me, you know, like a son after the gospel. Pastors' sons should be in a position to be able to follow in their footsteps. Huh? I, I mean, I mean, through God, not because the pastor put, put him there. Because uh, here, another thing, if you go in America and you find that the pastor is getting a million dollars a year as a salary, which is not too much. Because if, if, if Joel Austin, when he preaches, he brings in a hundred million dollars a year. A hundred million. They tell me he can't get one of them. One out of a hundred. What, what's wrong with y'all? You say a million dollars is a lot of money. Yeah, but he brought in a hundred million. Every year he brings in just around a hundred million. He should be getting about five million out of that. And he's been there for the last 20 years. So 20 years at five million, he will have a hundred million now. And people say, oh, all he wants is church money. But calculate how much he brought in for the church. Calculate 95 million by 20 years and see how much he brought in. You're like, you don't make that calculation. But him, don't do mathematics. You understand what I'm saying? If a man brings in a hundred million dollars in the church, he's entitled at least to five million. We're going to give you $20,000 a month. Does that make sense? Don't look at what he's getting. Look at what he's leaving in the coffers at the church. I still didn't make that point yet, so let me go along. Verse 4. To Titus, my own son, after the common faith, grace, mercy, and peace from God, the Father, and our Lord Jesus Christ. To you, Titus. So Titus is saying, Paul is saying, I left you in Crete. Crete is the name of an island, huh? I left you in Crete for a certain purpose. Are you following me, guys? Yeah, you follow me? For this cause left I thee in Crete. What's the cause? Two things here. Number one, that you should set in order the things that are lacking. God wants his church to be in order. God wants his church to be in order. People, equipment, church, whatever. That's why we washed down the church because it was looking really bad outside. And sometimes the outside tells a lot about the inside. When you say a house with all the bush around the, around the house, that tells you something about the mindset of the people who live in the house. So it was dirty, we wash it down. Huh? If the speaker's not working, fix them. There should be nothing at all that should distract you from God. Nothing should distract you from worship. So I let, huh? It's 1440, yeah. Okay, but do things decent in order, yeah, okay. Uh, for this cause, I left you in Crete. I didn't leave you there just to preach. I left you there to set in order the things that are wanting. You could take a wanting and put it lacking. Things that the church needed, I leave you there to fix it, Pastor. You see, when you don't do some things, it's okay. The Lord didn't call you to do it. The Lord just called you to help me. But if you don't do it, who God do it? Myself, who God do it? And people come up with some stupid words about micromanagement. The two worst words I've heard of in my life. Micromanagement. Micromanagement is when you go behind somebody to make sure that we get them to do that, they do it. You don't got to do that in a place where they get him paid their salary. You don't have to do that because they're going to do it. They want the salary at the end of the month. But in the church, you give them something to do. And they don't do it. And if you don't check behind them all the time, it will never get done. And they talk about micromanagement. That, that is stupid. In a church or any voluntary organization, you have to micromanage some people. Because they don't care about you or the church. They don't care if what should be done is done. So I left you to set things in order. And the second thing I left you there to do is to ordain elders in, the, in every city. Titus, you are supposed to be there to ordain elders. We haven't ordained any persons in this church for a long, long time. We might have a long, long time again unless God does something supernatural before we ordain some more. Okay? Cause, he, cause the instruction in verse 6. To ordain elders. What kind of elders? If any be blameless. If any be the husband of one wife. So that when I, I read the Bible, then the Bible said that divorce and remarriage is not acceptable by God. You leave pay well, come into the church. And within a year, you're married already too. I was looking at the pictures to see if some more people here went to the wedding. You know? But uh, 
Hey, look at me when a gypsy, when I want to know who you talk, when I want to know who you talk about. What do you talk about? Yeah, yeah, what do you talk about? Listen, listen. The husband of one wife, having faithful children. This will your point as elders. Your children can disqualify you from eldership. If you don't have faithful children, this is what the Bible says. Having faithful children, not accused of right or wrong or ruling. They don't belong to a gang. They don't out there, they're not out there, rabble rousers. So if you want to be an elder, look at verse 6. The qualification is there. And then he goes on to explain why. For a bishop, same word that translates pastor. For a bishop must be blameless. Blameless does not mean nobody's going to blame you. You're going to get blamed every day for something. But blameless does mean that after investigation and the dust settles that you come smelling like a rose. That's what blameless is. So the bishop must be blameless as the steward of God. Steward, uh, bishops uh, uh, must understand that they're the stewards of God, not the stewards of the people. Number two, they should not be self-willed. They should not be soon angry. They should not be given to wine. There should be no striker. Don't beat the wife or one of the other deacons or whatever. No striker. You see the qualifications? But Pastor, why well, you ain't got more elders in the church? You see the qualifying here? What happened to Shadia? She went? Huh? She won? Oh, tomorrow. Good. Hallelujah. I better watch it. Yeah. All right. Listen to verse 7. You want to ordain elders? He must be no striker. He must not be given to filthy lucre. Filthy lucre means money. So you don't employ deacons or uh, bishops for that. But filthy lucre today is also the two chickens that somebody going to bring for you out of their fridge. You don't preach for that. It's also the clapping. Oh, you're so good. Blah. Filthy lucre. You don't appoint elders in church that is interested in filthy lucre. Notice that the, word put, the Lord puts filthy ahead of it. Filthy. You take away God's glory. But on the other hand, he ought to be a lover of hospitality. That elder ought to be able to invite two or three men home to his house a Sunday after, after service and, and, and have lunch together. Or go down, take two or three men down, down um, on the boardwalk by Shafet and, and, and buy them some chicken and sit down and talk. These days they can't even trust elders to do that because the next week you'll have a new church. Them same elders will take those four people that they carry them by Shafet and start a new church with them. Yeah, that's what happens. Look around here and see. Look around here and see. All the big churches in Barbados teeth the first members from some place else. And most of them came from the People's Cathedral. And the People's Cathedral is like the ocean. You go back as many 40 foot containers inside there and fill all of them in, drive out, you ain't seen the hole. Huh? Because they're solid. All the big churches, thief members were someplace else. So when I said that, just though, I'm not joking. I'm not joking. Think, think of who you call the big churches in Barbados. But he should be a lover of hospitality, a lover of good men. That's not homosexuality. A lover of good men, a pure love from the heart. You could see some priests in churches that is, you know, a good man. I love Damien. He's homesick now, not, not so well. Well, maybe I love Damien because his wife told me, Pastor, if there's anybody that Damien believe in, it is you. Damien believe everything you say. Damien like to come to church. So if, if somebody like that love you, I ain't gonna love them back. <laughs> Huh? Yeah, you know what I mean? And then you could depend on Damien. You could depend on, you, you're the guys in getting jealous, huh? I can't call all the names of everybody in church. Give me a chance to call just one. Yeah? You could depend on Damien. So I gave Damien his keys to the church early. You don't get keys from this church early? You spend five or six years before you get keys. But he does this and he does that. Right now he's waiting to put up some fans up here. I have the fans ever since. 
so that the, the people on platform would not chew on, on Sunday mornings. We have two huge, huge fans. I wish I knew somebody so that I could call and tell them, well, damn me sick, so come and protect the fans. But I don't know about it's to call. So I'm going to go on, hoping that somebody will say at the end of the service, but pastor, I could put it there. I say, hallelujah, get your screwdriver and come. You understand? Don't let the people show again this Sunday. It's really, really hot up there. Amen. Amen? Okay, verse 8. Are they elders? He must be a lover of hospitality. He must be a lover of good men. He must be sober. He must be just, which means fear. A man of justice. You're not siding with anybody. He must be holy, separated from sin unto God. And he must be temperate. Temperate means self-controlled. He ought to be self-controlled. Number something more about him. He should hold fast the faithful word. If you've got to order an elder in church, you ought to be able to preach, even if it's only 15 minutes. Otherwise, what are you doing? Just opening and closing doors? We can get some outside the streets to come and open and close doors for us. He ought to be able to hold forth the faithful word as he has been taught. Anybody in verse 9? As he has been taught. That he, that he, the elder that you ordain, may be able by sound teaching both to encourage and to convince those that are on the other side. That's what elders do. Elders are not just to open and close doors. Elders are not just to stand up at the door. The time that we live in demands more than that. The harvest is plenteous. The laborers are few. And the few laborers lazy. So the, 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 the kingdom is suffering. We want men to ordain in the church who will fulfill this, uh, uh, this there. So let me go on now to verse 10, which I really want to get to, and tell you why Paul is laboring on Titus to really be faithful in ministering the word. Why? For there are many unruly, unruly and vain talkers and deceivers especially of the circumcision, verse 11, whose mouths must be stopped. Brethren, you hear me saying in church all the time, you cannot give everybody a microphone. There are some people who are against the church, against the pastor. You give them a microphone, they're going to open up their heart and say what they should not say, and that's why the calling program is cut you off. They don't let you say what you want to say. But you still expect somebody to come into church and break up the whole church by... by <laughs> I was, in a, I was in the service. The Lord was really moving in the service in this. And this woman was, the Bible says she prophesied more than three. She prophesied about ten times in that one service. And the last time she bustled out crying. Oh Lord, I let the devil use me. I let the devil use me. I call the, fa the pastor a two-faced man. I said that the pastor is a two-faced man. I let the devil, shut up. You should have known that from the beginning. So not everybody, you, you can't give everybody a microphone. You can't put everybody in the pulpit. The Holy Ghost will show you who to and how far they can go. So you can't put everybody to do everything. So let me go back here. There are many unruly. The word unruly, listen to what unruly means. Unsubdued, they're not subdued. Insubordinate means unruly. Disobedient is unruly. Uh, not put under, they're not put under any authority. So there are many unruly. Unruly also mean people who don't follow the rules. People who don't adhere to the rules. Unruly, you hear the word rule in there? They come to church and think there are no rules. So you come to church and you hear during the week we sit ahead of the aisle. Nobody don't take you on. We don't follow the rules in here. I follow rules only if I go to the Seventh-day Adventist church. Or if I go to the Roman Catholic church and Jehovah's Witnesses. Their rules I will follow. But Peg, well, come to church, follow rules? No. We know that because... We only have about 50 persons coming. We have 300 chairs in here. And it looks really, you know, we could come together and say, so the rule is when you come in, join the week, come forward to the aisle. Nobody should be behind the aisle. The same people sit behind the aisle every time. They ain't going to follow the rules. They determine they ain't following the rules. So what? You think you'll send me hell for you? Sit down? No. I'm not going to bother. I'll leave you in the hands of the Lord. I'm not, I'm not going to worry about it. There are certain rules. Come to church every time the doors open. God set that rule, not me. When you come to church, you know, get into some praying for the service and things like that. You know, there's some rule. But the Bible said here, there are many unruly. Unruly, I tell you what unruly mean. Okay. The Bible says also in verse 10, that there are many. Many. If there were a few, 
But there are many unruly people in the church. They don't follow rules. Many. And the Bible said not only many unruly, but vain talkers. Vain talkers. I went back to the Greek to find out what I mean. Uh, vain talkers mean they are mischievous people. They are idle. They are senseless talkers. They talk without making any sense. They are wranglers. Contentious. The Bible said there are many of those contentious, idle, senseless people in the church. Okay? But it says in verse 11, what do you do with them? Whose mouths must be stopped. How are you going to stop them? How are you going to stop their mouths? There are a number of ways. We're going to talk about that later. How are you going to stop their mouths? Whose mouths must be stopped? Look what else they do. Look what else these, these, these vain talkers do. We have people here at this church who still, every time I preach something, they still have to report to people who don't come to church anymore here. I got to tell people every time I, whatever I preach. Sometimes they send, you know. If people wanted to hear why I preach, they would stay here, they wouldn't leave. Huh? What you got to call everybody every time I leave and tell them what I preach about? Vain talking. Idle. Senseless. It doesn't make any sense. Because there's something behind that. You know what I mean? But it goes on. Anybody get anything of this? Not only are they senseless talkers, idle talkers, but it says that they subvert whole houses. You know, I think it's the queen bee. I'll mess myself up here now. But there's a bee that takes, go out and get the food and take down in the hole. Talk to me. The workers. The queen, the workers. You know you take the workers and feed them with those little the thing that killed that kill them. The point I'm making is that you put poison there, they take it and take it down inside the hole. And take it right back down inside the hole. And those worker bees kill everybody in the whole hive. Huh? Once you corrupt one person in the family, and it's usually the mother or the grandmother, usually. If you corrupt them with false doctrine, they have the propensity, they have the, they have the, the knack of carrying it to the whole family because it impact the children. Start with the children. Do you understand? Uh, when we used to hand up tracks, when we were not above this, we used to hand up tracks, we used to go up by the schools up Water Street. The two schools, the boys and girls school, and we would hand the children the tracks. Because you know where the track going? Right home in the house. You understand? So he said that these people, vain talkers, subvert subvert whole houses whole houses because you give somebody a false doctrine and they take it home and the whole house is in a mess and then later on in their spiritual life you observe you look back and you say but well, you know that all that family is the same how did they get like that all that family is the same they have the same attitude because they're those talkers who subvert. Don't forget verse 11 says at the beginning, whose mouths must be stopped. Verse, verse, verse 11, they subvert whole houses. How do they do that? How do they subvert whole houses? The Bible says, the, the word subvert, by the way, means to overthrow or to overturn. You can imagine people trying to serve God. And you overthrow or overturn the whole family. Not only one of the family, but the whole family. Now how you know that? It says that. Who subvert entire houses. You won't let your daughter live, live, live as she should live. You impact her and she go and subvert her whole house. You won't let your husband, you, you won't let your, 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 your son be a man for yourself. You, talk, you teach him nonsense. He goes and he subverts his whole house. With the same nonsense that you teach him. But the Bible said those mouths must be stopped. How do they subvert it? Look at look what they do. Teaching things which they ought not. They subvert, overcome uh, houses, overturn whole houses because they teach things which they ought not. So there's some things that ought not to be taught. They teach things which they ought not. Why? For filthy lookers sake an applause a few dollars and I like verse 12 
One of them, one among them says, the Christians, because he's talking to the Christians, that they're always liars. If you're always a liar, you gotta shut your mouth. Somebody gotta shut your mouth. They're always liars. They're evil beasts. They're slow bellies. And the Bible says here that this witness is true. So look what verse 13 says. Therefore, you should rebuke them sharply. Timothy, Titus, you got to rebuke them sharply. There's some people in church that you have to rebuke sharply. You can't fear whether they leave or not. The rebuke that you are giving them is come from God. God authorized you to do that. If they leave and go someplace else and then end up in hell, huh? well, that's their fault. But you are supposed, did you see those words there? Wherefore, rebuke them sharply. Why? That they will run from the church. That they will get upset. You know that they may be sound in their faith. When T-H-E comes before faith, the word faith now means doctrine or teaching. So you want them to be sound in their teaching, so you rebuke them sharply. Notice the word sharply. So you see the pastor's job? See what Titus had to do? Rebuke them sharply. That they may be sound in the faith, verse 14. That they're not giving heed to Jewish fables and commandments of men that turn from the truth. Listen to this. Unto the pure, all things are pure. For a person who has an impure mind, nothing that you do is pure. Everything you do is impure. That's what the Bible says, impure. That's what the Bible says. To the pure, all things are pure. You see two people driving in the car, maybe the pastor and another lady, you know, there's the aunt that's coming from over in the way. You don't know, but you're concerned about that. Before the man gets the next mile, you on your phone calling, I just see the pastor pass, don't you? Are you still driving a woman? You know what it does? That tells me what your mind is like. How do I come to that conclusion? Because of this. Unto the pure, all things are pure. A pure minded person will say, Oh, Miss Ikar, I know who the person is. I brought Samara here. Whenever I bring Samara here to help me work, I, uh, men are always under that tree. And I always stop and tell them, this is my granddaughter, you know, she's going in here to help me do some work. If I drive in a lady in the car and I see certain members of this church, I stop and open the windows so that they can see who it is. Because if they don't see, any number could play. They can say any kind of thing. Anybody understand what I'm saying? I'm make, making sense? Huh? You gotta be careful. So, I like to go and tell them, this is my granddaughter, so I must know everybody now. Then I bring a Fafi. You know, you know Fafi's a hottie? Not Fafi, Roshera. Roshera is a little hottie, you know, she dressed up and thing. So when they see me bring in Roshera, she's my granddaughter. What's wrong with you? Because people, people, Whose mouth was he shut? That's how, time, that's how he shut the mouth sometimes. You understand? You see somebody coming to church in the same taxi all the time, and your mouth running. Ah, why is she with that particular man all the time? She can't find no more taxi. I mean, the right to do that, because if you're a woman, you should have got common sense to know that you can't come to church in the same taxi all the time. Not coming to church if you're going to work in the same taxi, the people on the job will talk. Nobody talking to me. Oh, when they talking, that's not only the church. If you, as a lady, were going to work every day in the same taxi with the same taxi man, the work people at your work will talk to, and they have every right, especially if you call yourself a child of God. You call yourself a child of God, you're around with the same taxi man all the time. I listen to phone, phone to talk when they ain't saying nothing. Leave me. Leave me. Leave me. You can't find another taxi to pay. You can't find another taxi to pay. Taxi man and barbers can't get to work. Okay, okay, all right, all right. Go ahead as a child of God, right? It's a taxi, you're a pain. Go ahead and get your, get your reputation in the mud. Go ahead. Go ahead and get your... It's okay, go ahead and get your reputation in the mud. Go ahead and get your reputation in the mud. If it is your father, if it is your brother or sister, go ahead and get your reputation in the mud if you want to. Anybody understand what I'm saying? I went to school to high school that was right on the site where Purity Bakeries is now. When evening comes and you're walking down to school, down to the bus stand, you could not even walk with your sister. That's the days when they had morals. 
Huh? You could not walk down to the bus stand with your sister. But nobody know. You know, but nobody say no. And if you're a child of God, and you're supposed to adorn the gospel of Jesus Christ, you're telling me, well, this taxi man is my brother, he's my this, he's my, he's a taxi man. Is, uh, yeah. Well, go ahead if you want to. But when you get your reputation messed up, when you get your reputation messed up, don't come back crying. Because it's going to get messed up. This is Barbados. This is Barbados. It's going to get messed up. I know it might be your brother. Like I said earlier, it could be your father. But which, which, which you prefer? To get your reputation. When the Bible is here telling us tonight that our reputation should be pure. You prefer to do that and get your reputation. Well, I penny, I pay. <laughs> you leave me. <laughs> leave me. Am I making a sensible point or am I out of order? Am I making a sensible point or am I out of order? <laughs> let's, let's move on here and I'm going to finish this now. We have a few more minutes. Look. Look. Uh, so, verse 15. Unto the pure, all things are pure. And the people in your office, they're mine and pure. So when they see you dropping out of this, this taxi every morning, they're going to talk. I don't care what you say. You find the excuses, they're going to talk. You got a million taxis in Barbados. Why are you coming to work every morning the same one? And they're looking down through the window down there. You can't see them. and see you touching the man's fingers. <laughs> bye. Bye. Huh? You don't you even see them upstairs, but they're looking down. And you don't, because your hand down there, you say, bye. Bye. You twiddling the man's fingers. Get out of my face. <laughs> huh? Huh? Unto the pure, all things are pure, but unto them the are defiled. Nothing at all is pure. That's what the Bible says. But even their mind and their conscience is defiled. Now you see why Timothy had to be authoritative in his preaching. You can't make fun. Because people want to get to the rapture. People want to make it to the kingdom of God. To, to them, to people, everything that they do is correct. The Bible said, the Bible said every way of man is right in his own eyes. In the, book of, in the book of Proverbs, somebody go look at him and say, no, that ain't right. You're wrong. It's right in your own eyes, but in the sight of God, that's not right. So Timothy and Titus were tasked with the job of telling people things that they don't want to hear. And that's why the Bible says, um, and I'm looking for this verse, and I'm done. The verse says, uh, Titus, he said that you should rebuke with all authority. You should rebuke with all authority. Let me see if I find it here. Okay. Titus chapter 2. Okay. Ch ch Titus chapter 2 and verse 15. You can't always mind the things of this world that look quite nice, but as far as God's words are concerned, they're contrary to the word of God. So the pastor got to get up and got to say what he got to say. You can't compromise. Because to compromise is like the Lord said in Jeremiah 33, I set you as a watchman. When you see the thieves coming and the murderers coming and you don't open your mouth and say something and people get killed, their blood I'm going to require at your hand. Because you see them coming and you said nothing. On the other hand, if you sound the alarm and they die, you're free from their blood. They heard and they did what they wanted to do. Look at this one. Verse, verse, chapter 2 is the one where we talk about the, the older women and the older men and things like that. Look what Paul said. These things. Who want to hear me saying about the older women that should, they should be in behavior has become holiness and that they should not be given to, to much wine and all that. People don't want to hear that because that's what they're doing. So Paul was careful to say these things. Everybody say these things. These things speak. The word speak there in the original language means that people hear your voice. Open your mouth and talk. These things, what things? All the things that I've been talking about tonight. These things speak, number one. And number two, speak is the method you use. Number two is exhort. Exhort. These things speak and exhort. The word exhort means to encourage. Timothy, this is what you ought to be doing. Pastor Murray, this is what you ought to be doing. It doesn't matter whether people like you or not. You're not here to make friends and influence people. You're here to save people from hell. 
And before they get there, you, you're here to encourage people to go along the right path. And those who are going on the right path, you are here, Pastor, to encourage them to keep going on the right path. You are here to tell them to fight the good fight of faith. Uh, weeping might come, but you're going to win. Uh, if you can suffer, if you can reign with Christ, suffering is going to come. But you've got to endure some suffering th and things like that. That's what I'm supposed to do. Not here to tell you that you can go on the way you're going, and then in the end, you know, you hear, depart from me. No. That's not my job. These things speak. These things. You don't speak everything. My job is not to speak what's in the paper. In the newspaper. These things speak. Open your mouth and talk. And exhort, encourage, and rebuke. The pastor's job is to rebuke. The word rebuke means to bring you to a place where you feel convicted. Speak a message that you feel convicted. You're not supposed to hear a message and go home all the time saying, that was a nice message, I really enjoyed that. No, that's not how it ought to be. If you're living in sin, if something's going wrong, you should be rebuked. The word rebukes talk about bringing, making you feel convicted. It means making you feel the weight of your own pride. So the pastor will say something that make you feel the weight of your own pride. It, it, it means that when I rebuke, it causes you to have some introspection. That's what the word is supposed to do. You're not supposed to leave here like you went to crop over. You just come to ban. No, no, no. The word is to, is to comfort the afflicted and afflict the comforted. So that when you sit down on, you know, on your rear doing nothing, the word must come. So he said... He said rebuke, but he didn't finish there, with all authority. That's where I got the text from tonight. A call for authoritative preaching. Pastor, don't tiptoe to the tulips. Don't lessen down what you have to say. If you have to say something, rebuke with all authority. Use your authority. That's what we're supposed to do. With all authority. And, let, and while you're doing that, Titus, let no man despise you. I've spoken a lot of things tonight. I can't go back to recover what I've said. But thank God, the media team popped in tonight. And they set up the system so that at least we have this message tonight. We don't get Tuesday nights. We don't get Thursday nights because they're not here. But thank God we have tonight. And you guys should get this. And share, each one you should share with at least 10 people. Because these are things that people need to hear. This is a matter of life or death. And I don't know about you. <laughs> I don't care what is done to me. What is said about me. Who tried to tear me down. Who tried to discourage me in ministry. It did not make a hill of beans to me. No not make a hill of beans to me. I just don't care. These days I have my eyes on the prize. I ain't perfect. Paul himself said. Paul himself said, I have not yet apprehended that for which I am apprehended. To apprehend is to put your hand down your pants like a police do. Huh? Paul said, I haven't apprehended everything yet. Paul said, after about 20 years in ministry, Paul said that he's the chiefest of, the, of sinners, of whom I'm the chief of sinners. Paul, who wrote half of the New Testament, said that I'm the chief of sinners. Because, so he understood it was a process all the time. So if you fail, if you make a mistake, as long as you want to go on with the Lord, don't let anybody tear you down. Don't let anybody tear you down. Everybody makes a mistake. But there are those so high and mighty think that they're more than anybody else, and they want to tear you down. You're going to make mistakes all the time. So the Lord, he's wonderful. He said, if you confess your sins, what he would do? He's faithful and just to do what? To forgive your sins and to do what? To cleanse you from all unrighteousness. I would really love you to do two things before you get back here on Sunday. Number one, read Titus chapter one and two. I think there are only three chapters, and you can read the whole book of Titus. So that by the time you get back here, you say, at least I read a book in the Bible. And number two, I would like you to spend the next seven days praying for me as I minister the word of God, because it has to get a little bit tougher. Uh, things are getting real, real bad in the world, and to just pull apart and tiptoe around the gospel is not going to work. If you do that, People are going to end up in hell. And pastor, you are going to be held account if you don't open your mouth and say what you have to say. Look, I might fail you too. I might make mistakes. I put on my pants just like you. All right? 
I'm not saying that I'm perfect. I'm far from perfect. Ask my family. I'm far from perfect. But that ain't going to stop me from doing what God says to do. It's not going to stop me. Bow your head a little bit. Talk to the Lord for a minute. Then we're going to sing the last song we have down there. We're going home. Had a wonderful time here tonight. I really enjoyed it. Speak the things that become song doctrine and all that. That's really, really, really good. Hallelujah. Monica, you can stop recording now. Hallelujah. Leave the computers on. Just stop recording. Glory to God. Glory to God. Glory to God. What did this say to you tonight? Are you looking for the blessed hope? God.